Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us this afternoon. Um, I'm glad we're inside, right? It's better weather. So I'm really honored to be joined here on this panel with Edgar Heap of Birds, one of the most preeminent artists working in the United States, and Kathleen Ash Milby, it's a curator and a writer who I've looked up to for a very long time. I wanted to start by giving a brief introduction to some of the questions that the panel is going to bring forward, um, and also a little bit of uh, background um, to the Native contemporary art movement. Um, we'll be speaking about contemporary Native art, in fact, uh, since 1970, to give a bit of a background, and this is a really rare opportunity to learn more about those histories. So, as in the panel discussion, it says that there's a resurgence of Native art since 1992, which is definitely true. But I think in the U.S., the shift happened a little bit earlier, in fact. It happened in the mid-'80s. Uh, there were a few exhibitions that contributed to this. North of the border, it was one called Indigena, at the Canadian Museum of Civilization that was curated by two Native curators, Leanne Martin and Gerald McMaster, as well as Land Spirit Power that was at the National Gallery of Canada. In the mid-80s, in the United States, there were exhibitions like We the People at Artist Space that was co-curated by Jean Fisher and Jimmy Durham, and they're actually revisiting that exhibition right now in a show that they have up at the moment as well as another exhibition called We Are Always Turning Around on Purpose that was at SUNY New Paltz. Um, a version of the show traveled down to Oklahoma thanks to the efforts of Edgar. Um, and I think that these exhibitions pose perhaps something of a reckoning. For indigenous people, the arrival of Columbus was anything but a celebratory moment, and that's to put it mildly. Um, so I want to speak about these moments that led up to this rupture including artist-initiated movements and those that took place at smaller centers like the American Indian Community House Gallery in New York City, where Kathleen Ash Milby also worked. And we're lucky to be joined by both of them today. Edgar, as I mentioned, is one of the front runners in the development of Native contemporary art. He's worked with collectives like Group Material. He participated in important exhibitions like the 93 Whitney Biennial and an active participant in the East Village art scene in New York which was one moment where Native artists started to gain a voice. And space wouldn't be made in institutions if it weren't for people like Kathleen Ash Milby. She's been working as a curator and a writer in Native art for more than 20 years, I believe, although she looks very young. <laughs> Not only have her exhibitions traced important movements of our, in our field, they've also worked to shed light on practices that have flown under the radar. I think her survey of Kay Walking Stick making the argument that she's an American artist is incredibly important, and it's one example of this. But first, I want to turn to Edgar. I know you've prepared some images for us as well today, and specifically to speak about your early years working as an artist in the 70s and 80s. And my question as well is, what did it mean to be an Indian artist during this period? And how did you make space for your voice and for your ideas? <laughs> That's a tough question. Uh, well, I've, I've been really active with, uh, as a student as well, the University of Kansas, Royal College of Art in London, Tyler School of Art in Philadelphia. So uh, I came up through, I guess, art practice, basically. And so the native uh, distinction wasn't really what I was focusing on. I mean, later on, it became certainly what I do now. And uh, the first slide here is, is, the, is the horizon. And can I start with the slides now? So the, the horizon, uh, we're, we're from, uh, I guess, people of origin. That's how I see it, I guess, basically for native, native world. And we come from the horizon place, and that's looking west from Oklahoma City out toward my reservation. Um, and so that kind of space was really informative to me in my painting, and I'm a, I'm a painter, you know, been continuing with that for about 40 years or so. Uh, the next slide, please. Uh, but my point, too, that people of origin from Oklahoma, from the prairie, from the ceremonial center of, of our world, um, a place called Concho, Oklahoma, Watonga, Sealing, uh, Canton, Hammond, but um, that we have that ongoing connection with the earth and with the uh, ceremonies that tie to the earth, renew the earth, but we go, I go back and forth between 
always between that space and New York City, or I just had a show in Singapore recently and did a, some work in Documenta and was in Rio, or, you know, uh, just move around this earth as well. But uh, this is a, a piece I did, I mean, a, a site that I work with, with Group Material, which is a very important collective, very, very uh, political collective of artists in New York City in the 80s, and it was a place, it was a project called Terminal New York in Brooklyn. Okay, next please. And then, as I said, you know, going back and forth, being within the art world or being within the academic world, I'm a professor for 30 years, I taught at Yale, I taught in Cape Town, South Africa, RISD in Rhode Island. So it's, it's not kind of a sequestered kind of uh, junior ex experience, you know, it's not like trying to be somebody, I, we are, I am somebody, and I am somebody <laughs> working, have always been. Um, and my mentor was Vito Conchi. So I, Tyler, he came to our school one night and just blew it apart, you know, and, and, and the grad students fought each other almost over it. That's not art, that's art, that's the best art, that's not art, you know, like, and I, th I said, that's the best art, you know. Um, and so sexuality, you know, uh, sensitivity, aggression, violence, all these things that Vito showed us that night just showed me that I could do whatever the hell I wanted to do even more, and I was struggling with that. And so this is Terminal New York, his piece, hanging these masks up. And so within about three years from being a grad student in Philly at Tyler, I was hanging my piece up and bumped into somebody, and it was Vito Conchi. We were both in the same show in, at Terminal New York. Okay, next slide, please. So again, the content, obviously, is not, again, sequestered to be one or the other, like a polemical issue of uh, native versus white or Oklahoma versus New York or something like that. I and mean, I'm, I'm living in Oklahoma, I knew Vito, and then I was asked to come and work with group material, but I made a piece about Custer massacring the Cheyenne tribe at the Washita. And that was very much the key point to me. And our show was called Preparing for War with group material. You know, so I made this piece about the massacre uh, with Colonel Custer, which we're still trying to recover from. So, so it's not like you know, forgetting the past or, or trying to live in the past. You know, it's just part of our fabric of our life. Okay, next slide, please. And within that, that kind of uh, uh, issue there of living you know, with, with reality, I do have to say though that you have to be a person that will insert yourself into that position. No one asks to give you that. No one gives you that entree, no one gives you that privilege. You gotta make them put you in, let you get in there. So, so here I am you know, doing uh, a, a visit to Fort Marion where after the massacre, the, the, the warriors were put in prison and my grandfather was one of those warriors. So I'm in Florida where he was in prison. I'm gonna make a fire, I'm gonna make a prayer. I'm gonna, shut the, I'm gonna shut the fort down and make a fire and make these rangers put up with it and they're scared, you know. And so here I am again trying to insert these ideas. Okay, next slide. And those are prisoners of war coming out of Oklahoma from Fort Marion, to, to Fort Marion from the massacre at Washita. Okay, next slide. And that issue, certainly that experience is Guantanamo Bay today. So someone that didn't have any trial, no charges, just held in limbo, hostage. And that's what they did to the Cheyenne people. Okay, next. And the reason I show you all that history is Peter Jameson was the best director, I mean the best active artist that ever ran the American Indian Community House Gallery. And I started showing with him in New York City when I was a grad student in Philadelphia in 77. You know, and then one of the first pieces I showed was this uh, installation called Fort Marion Lizards. And I, Pete let me bring it in the, in the gallery. It was eight foot square. And he had, it, he had this space actually on 34th Street in, in off Madison. Uh, community House Indian Center was there. Later to move down to West Broadway to, by Leo Costelli. But anyway, here I am showing again this history of the Cheyenne people, but putting it in New York City to show everybody the history as well. Okay, next. And then again, to go the other direction, uh, Candace mentioned, we're almost turning around on purpose, the exhibition that we had at uh, uh, Old SUNY uh, Westbury, uh, o Westbury University um, in, in Long Island. And so Jean Fisher curated that show, and Jean was a great friend of mine, great colleague. She also wrote the, part of the catalog for my Venice Biennale project in 2007. So we brought the show, I was a, I was a professor in Oklahoma, we brought the show from New York to Oklahoma, uh, and then I added a, a ceremonial priestess into the show from my tribe who made the earth renewal, who would take you through the ceremonies herself. She made cradle boards, 
And so this piece, this is Patricia Mousetrail Russell. So she was showing with the artist from New York in Oklahoma. So, so again, it's not a one-way doorway. We're going to go back and forth and, and support each other. Okay, next slide, please. And so her work was very provocative, and uh, she's a wonderful, wonderful artist and woman, leader, a mentor. And so she was very keen about what happened at the Washita Massacre and the historical relevance of it, that Black Kettle, who was killed there, his family was murdered there, he was given an American flag to fly if he was ever attacked by the U.S. Army. And so he flew that flag that day when Custer came. And the flag is depicted there on top of the cradle board. And they killed him anyway. Mm -hmm. And so from that point forward, the Mouse Trail Russell family said, that's our flag. We own that flag now because they dishonored it when they killed our grandpa. So you can put it on anything you want to put it on. So she put it on her cradle board. Mm -hmm. She said, the Cheyenne owned that flag now. And so we show that in the space. And also in that same time frame of showing this piece, the space shuttle blew up in the sky. And so the mixed beads and the rocket on the right side is a space shuttle. She's showing you how kind of American technology is disappearing. Mm -hmm. Okay, next slide. Mm -hmm. This is the last slide I have. And this is my work that I'm continuing today. So I still work with text. And I have this 16 drawing installation or one very similar uh, right here at Miami Basel at Pulse. Uh, and it's, it's on view right now. But, so I've been working with monoprints, and some of them deal with history, some of them deal with politics, some of them deal with more of a lyrical, sensual sensibility. So I'm working on all these different kind of veins of, of expression and putting them together into a matrix. And I've had you know, about two or 300 of these prints, and I keep making them in different studios in LA or Santa Fe or also in Hawaii. Uh, the one I guess I would mention is on the, the bottom left there. Uh, Indian stole target Obama bin Laden Geronimo. And that piece is certainly you know, pretty well known you, if you remember the time when they did uh, capture bin Laden. And again, the, the similarities with Islamic persecution and Native American persecution in that when they killed bin Laden, they gave him an Apache code name. You know? So of course, at that point, if you're an Apache, you might be in the army looking for bin Laden, and they can give the main that they hate the most, <laughs> Apache name, a Geronimo name. So how safe are Indian people today in this country? You know? So that's what that piece is about, that they really uh, have so targeted Native American people. Mm -hmm. OK, thanks. Yeah. It's like the historical amnesia always comes, circles back around. Um, when we were, we had a pre-conversation about this conversation, and. <laughs> One of the things that came up is uh, we were talking a lot about the kinds of exhibitions that marked kind of watershed moments. And Kathleen, you were really clear that those moments happened, you know, not just in large mainstream institutions, but they were also taking place in places like American Indian Community House Gallery, which you mentioned already, Edgar. Um, but a lot of these movements were also led by artists as well. And, um, and I think it'd be interesting to, to hear more, Kathleen, from your perspective, you know, what were these moments? What did they change? What were central questions that were operating at the time for you? Um, could I get my first slide up, please? <laughs> oh, great. OK, so I, I picked two different um, images from two different key moments in Native American art and contemporary Native American art. One of them is from the exhibition Land Spirit Power, which is one of these key exhibitions around the um, quincentennial in 1992. Um, also, just a few years after that was the opening of the National Museum of the American Indian uh, in New York City. And you see Gerald McMaster, who's an artist and curator, um, working on one, uh, planning for one of the installations that became very iconic for us. Um, certainly, that was a pivotal moment. And there were big institutions forming, and um, big institutions in the US and in Canada, especially, were really acknowledging this. Mm -hmm. And, um, and then at the same time, there were um, museums and universities um, all over the country that had their own exhibitions that were responding to this, this sudden attention to American Indian art. But what I learned, and, and this is how my introduction to contemporary Native American art was, really at this pivotal moment, what I learned is that there was so much that was happening in the 1980s, such as you, you've experienced yourself, Edgar, um, and and of all places in New York City. Yeah. Um, there was a curator and artist named Lloyd Oxendine who passed away just a few years ago who started his own gallery in Soho for contemporary Native American art. 
Um, and it only lasted a few years, but I think that was really the seed of what's been um, sometimes called the uh, New York Native movement um, at that time. He also did a special issue of, of a major art journal at the time as well. Right, yeah. So at the same time um, that this was happening, that Lloyd was starting his gallery and beginning to do these shows in New York, um, Art in America, um, the editor um, at that time, became interested in doing a Native-themed issue. And so uh, he approached Lloyd to do um, an article on contemporary Native American artists. Um, but within this larger issue on the Native American theme. Um, now, unfortunately, the majority of that uh, 1972 issue was really about non-Natives' view of Native Americans right. as a subject, right. right? So there's an article on the, um, the Indian and the Western movie, and there's, of course, George Catlin and Carl Bodmer. But um, for Lloyd, it was so important that he get contemporary Native artists in there. So um, he had this article. Um, featured a number, um, almost 30 Native American artists, um, and that was a big, a big turning point, I think. Um, and then shortly after that, Pete Jemison started the gallery at the American Indian Community House. And I wonder if you could mm -hmm. maybe also contextualize the American Indian Community House as well, because it wasn't just a gallery. Some of us know it as a gallery, but it was broader yeah, it was, than it that. It was a social service center, you know, that all kinds of uh, social issues shared there. Even, even well, wonderful Henne Gigama had his theater there. Yep. So American Indian, you know, theater company was there performing with, with amateur actors as well. Right on, right on, it, when I was involved heavily was on 34th Street, then later it was downtown. But when it was it all together, social services and the art and the theater, it was really a wonderful uh, institution. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, it was, um, it was there for a number of years before they started the art gallery. Uh, Pete Jemison was the first curator. And after he left, um, Lloyd came in and he was a curator for a number of years. Okay. Um, and, and these are all artists who decided that um, they needed to take action for Native artists to get recognition. And I think that this movement of Native artists basically making their own opportunities because they were not getting the opportunities in the institutions. Um, can you actually switch it to the next slide? I've got a few images on the bottom from the American Indian Community House, and this is from the location um, on Broadway, 708 Broadway in the, in the village when I worked there, um, starting in 19, oh gosh, um, starting in 2000, actually, after Joanna Big Feather left. Um, and then across the top, I actually selected some images to also recognize American Indian contemporary arts because the American Indian Community House Gallery wasn't the only nonprofit uh, native-driven, um, independent gallery out there. Uh, American Indian Contemporary Arts um, started in the early 90s. Um, there was also uh, Two Rivers Gallery in Minneapolis. There's the Daybreak Star Gallery um, just outside of Seattle. So there were a number of locations around the country where native artists could have these exhibitions. Um, other artists who were really involved at this time in, in sort of Seeding that change were uh, Jean Quick to see Smith, uh, George Longfish. Uh, so these were artists who were out there being very, very staunch advocates for other artists and doing their own exhibitions and just really driving um, this movement. And when I worked at the gallery um, between uh, 2000 and 2005, this was a wonderful place to have an opportunity to not be constricted by um, an institution. I mean, of course, there was like almost no funding. <laughs> so, you know, we had that freedom as well. But um, it was a place where um, people who were interested in becoming curators could go and organize their first shows. And it was a little bit, you know, lower pressure. And, um, you know, we had our local audience, but it was a place in New York where whenever Native people came into the city, it was a place people always dropped by. Yeah. So it became that kind of nexus socially as well as for contemporary Native art. It felt like a community. I remember the first show that I went to in New York was there, and it was one that you had organized. Mm -hmm. So my question was um, also, what kind of shift did these exhibitions make? Because um, you're talking about artists, you know, working to create space. Whether, where Edgar, you were also speaking about the fact that, you know, for you, you immediately started working, I think, in a very collaborative way. 
you didn't you didn't see it necessarily as making space, but what I see your work doing is talking back. It's or, yeah, talk, or just being a participant. You know, like, like Peter and I, we, we were asked to go to do a project with just about Midtown in, in mm -hmm. Tribeca, and it was uh, probably 80 or 81 or something like that. And so they asked different art spaces throughout Lower Manhattan to send sort of a delegation to form this big group show. And I'm really proud to say that I showed with Anna Mendieta that night. I mean, Anna Mendieta had work there, Diod Bay had work there, David Hammonds had work there. And later I would show with David at Times Square on the computer billboard with Keith Haring, just as, again, at, at, at on par, like Keith Haring, myself, Jenny Holzer, David Hammonds, Jane Dixon. Yeah. So there was no Indian nothing about nothing. <laughs> so that's what I like. It's like not about an Indian anything. It's like you're an artist. Like, like Keith Haring's an artist, and we were all chosen out of the same sort of, uh, you know, milieu. But, but, but anyway, so Peter went forward, and I did too, mm -hmm. and then we showed in Tribeca. Then later that led to other projects, you know, so, so it wasn't, so there, there was a, you know, supportive nucleus of, of, just, of uh, the, you know, the gallery, uh, community house gallery, but, but it wasn't that, well, it wasn't what you needed all the time. You needed to move into the new museum, or mm -hmm. in 88, I would show at the Museum of Modern Art, you know, and, 88, I would be at the Whitney Biennial. We'd be in those shows and not in any kind of native show, yeah. just as another artist that showed up Museum of Modern Art. And, and, uh, and but the thing about Peter, though, that we, it's good we bring him up because one of the things I want to say is that he was from a community, you know, in upstate New York, Burn Victor, New York, sort of Tuscarora, Seneca, those, those places. And he went back home. And I think a lot of the artists that were in the city felt that way. They weren't like, you know, expatriates to live in New York and make their way and become superstars. Maybe they would spend some time and then, then ditch it and go back to what really mattered, which was the reservation life or the community life. And he did, he left it all and went back, you know, and I went back home. I took my work actually out of just above Midtown Gallery with Anna Mandetta, and I put it in my Volkswagen bus and drove back to Oklahoma. Right. And they said, you'll never hear from you again. What are you gonna do? Why right. go to Oklahoma? What's out there, you know? <laughs> And that was in the 80s, you know. So, so that was that they were they were you know they weren't right about that, obviously. But so so going home was a very important step. Yeah, I, you know, and this is something that comes forward in your practice and also how you introduced it today, which is you know the role of community, also the role of ceremony in your practice. I think is a, is incredibly important. You started with an image, you know, from your home. Um, but I also think that, I don't know if you found this, Kathleen, like a lot of artists who were coming to the Community House Gallery and to NMAI, they were kind of also displaced from their communities, so they were kind of forming new ones at the same time. Well, I think that, um, for me, I feel like the Native art community is a community unto itself. It is a community of, of, of artists and, and scholars in, the, in Canada and the U.S., and New York I think it was, it's a microcosm of that because it really was a multi-tribal community that was there that came together at the community house. Um, certainly there were more local, there's more local um, native people, but um, it was a place where you could just come and socialize and, and there wasn't, um, it didn't matter where you were from. Yeah, and I was thinking, you know, more about the, well, the title of this, this question, or this panel is also what of, indigenous art now, so also speaking about this moment, but I thought it was incredibly important to also speak about what was very formative in the 70s and 80s and why there was space being made at that time. One is in part because there were a lot of artists who were going through art school at the time. They were young, they were just coming out of these programs. The same thing was happening in Canada. They were advocating for institutions to change their acquisitions policies, to change their relationships, to change the way that they were showing work not only in contemporary spaces, but also very importantly within museums themselves. You know, these were not just artifacts. They, they had a certain ideology that accompanies the, these objects. Um, and for, for many of us, these are not, you know, inanimate things or they're animate things. Um, so then I was starting to think, you know, there, there is certainly a, more visibility now um, for indigenous artists. We've also sort of shifted terms as well. What used to be American Indian art or native art or in Canada, Aboriginal art is now often seen as indigenous art. You know, sometimes these focuses come, this is my own, you know, theory, but in times of Western crisis. So at the moment, I think there's a kind of, there's certainly an, an environmental crisis. And so there's been a lot of trafficking and in indigenous thought within decolonial studies, for example. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, my, something we were talking about before is we don't see this as a trend, um, but what do you think? 
Well, uh, I would go back to what happened in the, in the late 70s in New York City and how the capitalism was like running amok and, and there were major, major things happening with Wall Street and, mm. and the galleries were, were they moving ahead and selling big, big ticket things and locked out most young artists. Mm. You know? And that's what happened. That's why Lower East Side appeared, like you know, Macy, Tracy, and Tracy Manson, Manson yeah. and all those things. Um, and even someone like, uh, well, we're talking about group material and, and uh, Tim Rollins was in group material and Tim Rollins was one of the directors of group material and he was actually teaching in the Bronx and he had a bunch of you know, Puerto Rican students that got together, became kids of survival, and then they were like sort of attacking the, you know, the, the, the empire with their work, and, and they couldn't get in. Then lo and behold, they would show up Mary Boone and make millions of dollars, <laughs> these kids from the Bronx. So they sort of actually subverted the whole thing, uh -huh. you know, too. But, but it's that kind of, kind of great energy for when you're locked out of something, and you gotta make your own way, you know. And that's what the Community House Gallery was, even in Soho by Leo Costelli. I remember being in there one day, we were mopping the floor to have the opening. It wasn't like, you come here today and you get your name tag and you're gonna have a little discussion about it. So no, you gotta build, <laughs> you put the tent up and have the discussion. And, and that's what's lacking. You know, we, have, we need a, more, a little more of that, a little more elbow grease, a little more you know, sweat equity to build these things yeah. and, and hopefully to, to build a new one. You know, we, we're talking sort of nostalgically about what happened and kind of what's happening now. And I'm 60 years old, you know, and, I, and I, I've been through all these things. And so I'm looking for the next wave. And I'm not going to make it, you know, so it's like, who's going to make it? Who, who out there, the youthful spirit is going to make something? I don't even know what it is yet. Yeah. See, so even, it's not in Santa Fe and it's not in New York City. And it's not, you know, maybe it's in South Dakota, maybe it's in Montana. I don't know where it is, but, but it's like, can they make something creatively to even have a venue of art? Yeah. You know, sort of like what's happening with... Uh, you know, with, with artists that are doing more interventions and so on, you know, with Kate and Raven and so on. They're, you know, they're making new experiences that are like without venues, you know. So, so that's what I'm looking for, is someone to actually kickstart something that's going to be more dynamic and, and uh, push it further ahead. You know? What do you think, Kathleen? Well, there's been a tremendous amount of change in the last 25 years. Um, I published an article in um, the summer issue of the um, Art Journal, a College Art Association publication, which I co-wrote with Ruth Phillips from a, a Canadian scholar. And it was basically surveying the last 25 years of the exhibition of contemporary Native art. And it's huge, the amount of changes that have happened from Lloyd's work and Pete Jeminson's work in the 70s until now. Um, Certainly, the 90s were a really rich period for these smaller organizations and for artists kind of making their, their own spaces. But in the last 10 to 15 years, there's been a lot of growth of exhibitions and collecting in more mainstream exhibitions and more mainstream um, museums. Uh, Edgar and I worked on a major project at the Venice Biennale in 2007. Um, the Idle Drug Museums had many, many exhibitions and a fellowship funding um, Native artists um, for 20, I think it's 20 years that they've had that going, it's hard to believe. Um, so I think there's been a lot more opportunities and a lot more exhibitions are happening and certainly in Canada, the growth has just been exponential. Um, even just looking at the projects that are happening this year, which someone was doing recently. Um, so, you know, there have been gains, but I don't know that there haven't been losses because when I have a younger person coming to me who wants to be a curator and looking for guidance, I don't have some place to send them like I could have sent them before to the community house where I could say, hey, they always need people to organize exhibitions there. Go there, propose an exhibition, be a guest curator, get your feet wet. Mm. Um, there aren't spaces like that anymore. So there's good and bad in the change that's happened. <laughs> yes, there are. <laughs> That's coming from the back. Um, I think for me, one of the biggest questions I have is, um, you know, you're looking at uh, institutions that collect American art, but yet they have largely ignored, except for a select few artists, you are one of them, um, you know, the, the movements and, and the great work that has been made. Um, by American Indian artists, and so I think that this is, this is a major gap. You know, how can we really understand American art if we're leaving out a big part of the picture? Um, so that, that's a question that I have. And then another question, and perhaps one to end with before we turn to the audience, is, you know, what do you think are the most pressing questions that you have now? Like, what would you tell young artists? Or what are, what are artists working on that you're seeing, Kathleen, that is perhaps different than 25 years ago? 
Well, I would bring up the magazine. Well, it was mentioned earlier, Art in America, and I have the copy here. And we talked about it in 1974 when Lloyd Oxendine worked on it. And I was asked by Art in America about a year ago to work on the cover. And so I produced this, set, this print in Santa Fe. I work with Michael McCabe, a Navajo printer, a mon monotype printer. So, so do not dance for pay, and it's a monoprint. Um, and then I worked also very, very, I think very strategically and very privileged to <laughs> flip the word backwards America on the cover. So I challenge anyone to do that, you know, next, next time around. But uh, so, so that, that's a, a major point of, of contention, but to, to change America, to look at native the world differently. So you have to turn America around, literally. So here's the October issue backwards. Here it is, you know, here it is. <laughs> and someone said that can't be done. Well, here it is, here it is, you know. And, and, and uh, they did it, they published them all, they're all over the world, they're on the internet. And for me, it's a bloody kind of a dictate. It's like, it's like blood sp splashed words. And, and so when you do get the privilege or the opportunity to work, um, as, a, as a, I guess as a, as a in, in part representative of Native American in some way, you don't want to dance for pay. You don't want to put on your war bonnet and jump around. You know, you want to actually get something done. We, and we've, we've jumped around with war bonnets and look what, where has it gotten us? Nowhere. You know, so, so if you make a lot of pastoral weak art and sell it, you know, somewhere in Scottsdale or Santa Fe, well, that could have been a good job, but it didn't do us, get us very far. So I would quit doing that, you know. So, so what should we do next? And that's what that, that means in a sense. So I worked on the issue, the, the interview, the photography. And so actually to take a magazine and make it your work. You know, take, take a, a, the most famous magazine in the world for art and make it your artwork, you know. Give it a presence, and, and Will Smith, the editor, you know, is a colleague of mine. So we work, we learned to work together with that. So that that was what was really important to me. And but again, with the photograph we took, that's in the side of the magazine. You can look at it later. Was on the red rock from that horizon, where we would make the prayers and make some of the renewal that's important to my life. And, and no one saw the fire being made in the in the magazine, but it was burnt before. The wood was burned before we had the photography team come in. So the place where all the prayers are is in some way sort of inside of that page, but you can't see it. So that's what we're really missing, too, is that all these ideas are propelled by a spiritual guidance of the earth renewal and the ceremony of this, of this land and how to bring the songs back and, and create this way to renew the earth for all the people everyone included, and, and so artists today can have that as a subject matter, <clears throat> but I would challenge artists to go there and sing the songs, not make a painting of the songs or make a recording of the songs. Sing the songs, well, learn, you don't know the songs, learn the songs. You know, pay the time to go there and learn from the elders and let them make fun of you, let them belittle you, pay your dues, and go learn what you need to learn because you're the elder now, you'll be the elder soon. So, and if you don't do that, we won't have anything to make art about. Well, I do think that um, there is a reassessment going on right now in the museum community about this idea of American art and what that means and how maybe that has been um, exclusive in a way that has excluded Native art and maybe that needs to be rethought. So I think there are institutions, major institutions, um, that are reassessing their definitions and they're collecting. Um, I am hopeful that it's not a passing interest, that it's not a fad that happens every 25 years or more. I mean, yep. you know, it's longer for the art, art in America. <laughs> but I, I, I have great faith that, um, that this is not going to be the only issue, that, and it isn't the only issue that's going to be featuring Native artists in the future. Um, so I would say to uh, Native artists today that, you know, they just have to keep doing great work. You know, they just have to keep pushing. Yeah, great. Um, we do have a bit of time. I know it's get, getting a little late, but there's a microphone. Um, if anyone has any questions for any of us or comments, um, please bring them forward. Hi, thank you so much for a lovely panel, lovely discussion. Um, I work with indigenous people in Australia for the past 30 years, and my question is about this coming back home 
and how many native people have been going back home, in fact, to engage native communities to become consumers of art, not just consumer of indigenous art, but consumer of art in general. And I'm just wondering what um, you think about this particular issue of consumerism and who is consuming native art. Well, you would probably know that uh, the Aboriginal Australian Richard Bell um, has a great painting that says Aboriginal art is a white thing. Um, and he's talking about the, the creation of it, not only the creation of you know, things like desert, desert painting or dot painting, um, but also the creation of the market for it. Um, so that's, that's one, a little bit of a, of a jaded answer, but what do you think? Well, I worked a lot in Australia. I worked there, I uh, had a big project with Ab Aboriginal artists city, in, in cities of Sydney and Adelaide. You know, we did 16 songs, and I was at the Olympic Art Festival at Kasula as well with Judy Watson and other artists, and Gordon Hookey and Fiona Foley, and so they're all, they're all my friends. And I was recently in, in Bundesburg, too, looked at some public art work there. But, uh, well, yeah, going home uh, is so important. I, I went up to uh, Laura and went to see the rock art and got a tribal elder to take me on top of the mountain, you know, and he, and he actually, he sang us in, and when we came back out, he erased all our footprints, you know, mm -hmm. and I got to see the art, and he let me photograph some things, and the point about that visit was to certainly uh, inform myself, but I made a, a duplicate set of prints and gave them all to the artists in, the, in Sydney from Redfern, which they couldn't perhaps afford to get the Land Cruiser and fly to Cairns and go up to this mountain. So, and they were really excited about these drawings, these, you know, rock art drawings. And so, so yeah, it's about how do you get back and, and share that and have that kind of propel your work. And, and we help each other do that. You know, I think they help me too. And so we help each other uh, kind of go home in a way. I think your question's also kind of getting at how important is the market and the representation of native artists in the market to the visibility. Um, of the field, and, and I think that's something that um, a lot of artists have struggled with. There are not very many Native artists represented by major galleries in this country. Um, someone was asking me recently about how many Native artists were in the art fairs here in Miami. I, you know, I'm not aware of any right now. Um, Edgar, are you represented here this yeah, year? I'm, I'm in Pulse. And so, do we know anyone else who is here in Miami besides you who's native? What's that? Do you know the name of the person? Oh, okay. Um, well, the short story is not very many. <laughs> not very many. Okay, that's good. That's good. Um, but this is, this is because there aren't a lot of native artists that have representation. Um, so this is, this is always the ongoing struggle, whether or not you're creating your work for the market, whether you're creating the work for your community, whether you're creating your work for some, some other purpose. Um, and it's something that, that Native artists struggle with. And the, the price of Native art is very low compared to um, a lot of other um, contemporary art. And so, you know, it's a buyer's market, actually. If you, if you get turned on to it, <laughs> Wow, there's amazing things you can have. Um, so anyway, I, it's definitely a conundrum. I think it's, it's part of the um, challenge for Native art getting that visibility because galleries do really drive that visibility in a big way. Well, there's questions like I was talking to um, James Luna quite a while ago and I was asking him, you know, where, where, do these, where do the photographs of artifact piece exist? And he said, oh, I have them all. And I said, you, know, you mean they're not, there's none in any museum collections, he said, no, no, it, they're, they're just in my collection. To me, that was kind of mind-blowing, you know, this, this performance that really marked a shift uh, in, in the idea of culturally specific institutional critique, and it's just sitting at home. Um, so I think that there's a lot of work that needs to be done in that regard, but I thought that your question also got at another question, and that is that the, how we define art. You know, art isn't necessarily something, it is something that exists here, but it's also something that exists at home in community. And it's something that is a practice often for many of us that is an expanded practice. It includes not just you know, the things that we make, but what we do, um, our role back at home if you have that relationship with your community. Um, so, so that's something as well. Well, that's a really important point that, uh, uh, like even the rock art we saw at Laura, um, I could tell that a lot of that work was made as a performative act 
and it looks like a drawing, but really there's songs and drumming and, and percussion in the rock. And so certainly uh, for, for a lot of work that we do on, on the, the community level, uh, in the ceremonial level, it's all done in a programmed way that you, that's traditional, but it's done with all the songs and the, and the activities within you know, the circle. Um, and so, that, so that, 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 that practice, that's what I call you know, the, the, the principal art. And, so, and that's not something that would ever go to a museum or a gallery. And so so we, we kind of talk about these things but yet, again, we're already biased toward a commercial uh, experience, and so, but, but the original experience is, is non-commercial. Does anyone else? Oh. Hagar, can you talk about Pulse and how it is involved with Art Basel a little bit and what you're doing in Pulse, where that exhibit is? Yeah, P Pulse, Pulse Gallery, uh, well, the, well, the, well, the Pulse, uh, uh, Miami Pulse is, is, is on the beach, and. Uh, and the, my, the gallery I'm working with is Garris Hall, Garris Hahn Gallery, and we have a card from one of the, from the gallery here with some details on it. And uh, there's 16 drawings, I mean 16 prints that are up right now. And also, I worked on a big project in Key West, Florida, so I did interventions in Key West, uh, representing four native tribes from Florida. And so I brought one of the sign panels, their native host panels that you might know about my work in the native host series. And so there's a, there, a tribe right here in Miami, and there's a circular village in Miami that is a remnant of that, of that time when they lived here. And so I made an honoring sign for, for that village, and it's in Pulse right now, too. So I made it a point to ask the gallery, uh, Mary Garris is here. She's uh, right, sitting right there. So I asked Mary uh, if I could bring that, that sign panel along as an addition to my, my offerings in my monoprint series, um, uh, Secrets of Life and Death, uh, to bring an honoring piece for the f tribes of Florida, and, and we did, and she hung it yesterday, so it's, uh, it's up on the wall. So, so we're, we may be the only spirit presence here that actually honored tribes from here. So again, not really, again, well, what Indian show is here, but no, what, what, who, who was here before? Yeah. Tomorrow. yeah, tomorrow it'll be open. So, so I made it a point to really make that uh, gesture here now and, and, and again, it's not about me. You know, it can't be about, always about you all the time. And where are you going to be? Well, who cares where you are? You know, it's what, 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 what is this earth doing? How can we honor this earth? And so that, that sign panel does that right now. And, I, and again, it might be the only one that, only effort that we had made of this whole giant festival that honored this, this place in a native way. And, and you can go see that sign, and it'll be up to tomorrow. You know, then it's going to leave. Uh, so anyway, that's what we're doing at, at Miami Pulse. Anyone else? Yeah, in the in the back row, and then second row. Okay, so my name is Tara, and I was the one hollering, "They're still here! The places are still here!" Um, because I, you know, I've had the chance now to come back home here to Florida, um, the the home where my my parents chose, and I see all these t small, tiny, little spaces, including, you know, the. Um, History Fort Lauderdale, where I work, that are struggling to find shows and struggling to connect with artists who are, you know, can can put together really good shows. And for example, you know, there's this one guy that we've been working with, his name is Elgin Jumper, and he really likes Andy Warhol. So he copies Andy Warhol sometimes with, you know, pictures of his ancestors, Osceola or whoever. But the galleries, the big galleries, the ones that have money, not like mine, they don't care. Like, I mean, even here at Art Basel, I mean, I tried to talk to some guy because he had a Cowboys and Indians Warhol and, you know, like I wanted to, you know, find out more about it, but he wouldn't even talk to me. He put his hand like that and he's like, I'm not interested in talking to you. I'm like, oh, okay. And then there's the other guy with the giant Greek dream catcher. I'm not even going to talk about that, about, you know, <laughs> the guy from the UK that, you know, that's hanging near the entrance. Yeah. But like these things are problematic for me because, you know, I was in Toronto in 1992 and like it was amazing, the singing and the connectedness and the elders saying, you know, find who you are, you should be who you are, even if you are, you know, like these things are important to the future too. And so, I mean, I'm here today at Art Basel, but for the first three years, I'm like, Art Basel, like they don't care about us. Like they don't care about the people who live here. It's all people that come mm -hmm. in from out of town. So like, I don't know, I know I'm talking about a lot of issues all at once, but. Anyways, I'll just be quiet now. Thank you. There was also a question right in front. Yeah. Yeah. Hello. 
I come from South America, where there are a lot of indigenous people, and even they speak indigenous languages all the time as a common everyday thing. You see them on the, on the bus stops, um, supermarkets, banks, schools, everywhere. And for example, in Paraguay and Uruguay, more than 50% of the people are bilingual. And the official languages of the, those countries are also indigenous and recognized. However, whatever I am, where, 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 wherever I find um, indigenous groups, like you were mentioning people who were dancing, unfortunately, for example, in, in, in southern Paraguay, most of the, the indigenous groups that are noticed by the media are those who dance. And they are really happy to do that, and they are fine with it. And uh, unfortunately, they are very colorful, so they, they grab all the tourist attentions, and they gave them a lot of money, etc. What I, what I feel is that in indigenous communities in South America, they have a very strong um, neglect and rejection of the word contemporary. So I was wondering, is it American indigenous contemporary uh, somehow a res more respected notion, con concept, trend, etc.? Thank you. I think, I think the situation in South America with the, the relationship between indigenous and non-indigenous people is very different than it is in the United States and Canada. I think it's, um, I'm not an expert in, in the indigenous people of South America. Most of my experience is, is obviously north, um, north of the border. Um, but yeah, it's very different. It's very different how um, contemporary um, indigenous art is, is developing in, in that part of the world. and. I think the perception of it is very different, even as you say, within the communities. Mm -hmm. I did work with um, an Inga artist named Carlos Hakanamihoy, who did very large, um, he was from Colombia, he had these very large abstract paintings, and, and he was really um, unique in that sense, that he had um, this experience in the mainstream art world, and, um, but, you know, I don't know. Yeah. I just came back from Guatemala. Um, it wasn't my experience there that people are not engaged with contemporary. Most of the contemporary art artists that I met in Guatemala, and this wasn't necessarily my stated focus in going, I was doing research for uh, Biennial, uh, were Maya, were indigenous, including uh, an incredible composer, a maestro named uh, Joaquin Oriana, uh, who's been making, you know, a version of the my, of the Guatemalan national instrument, the marimba, in radically different ways, you know, since the 1960s. Um, so I think there's a few things tied into your question. One is um, the economic situation that a lot of indigenous peoples find themselves in, which often isn't one that's uh, conducive to, you know, to being, to even sometimes having a voice outside of your community. Another thing I think that's tied into your question is that, of course, um, people will reflect what they think is others want to see. So people will dance if they can make money dancing. Sure, you know, what, what are other opportunities that they have at that uh, moment in time? And there's a long history of that in North America as well, in Canada and Banff where I, I used to work. Um, but also people are very savvy in this, so they're also going to mimic, you know, this stereotype that gets projected back. And so sometimes these performances reflect more about the people who are watching than the people who are performing, in a way. Um, so that, that's one thing that I was thinking about. Um, certainly they're, they're yeah, it's, I think it's a question of agency, it's a question of presence. Um, but in, there are certain parts like across the Canadian Arctic where I've also worked, you know, the, the language that's predominantly spoken there is Inuktitut and different dialects of Inuktitut. Um, so yeah, even in North America, this is, this is something. And that issue of agency and, and, the, and what, what Candace shed was very profound that 
uh, doing something that they want you to do or what they're looking for you to do. I don't know how you even paraphrase what you said there. But that, that, that's the whole issue right there. That, that's, that's, all, that's, what, what, that's what all this is about, is perception. And this, this crazy big building over here with people pay a lot of money to go walk around in there. You know, like, it, it's all the perception of what they're expecting and the money that's in, been exchanged. And, and so as we, as we discuss issues today, you know, we've come round and around about galleries and institutions and museums. And, and, and from my perspective, you know, they're very unhealthy things, you know, because they haven't done us very well. Obviously, we have horrible art for Native American representation. And galleries were all steering that, that, that bus around, you know, so we got, they did a horrible job at it. Um, and so you got to think back, well, what's good then, you know? And for me, obviously, I've come to another point. I've been working for 30, over 30 years. So now I'm coming to galleries and I are collaborating. We're trying to do good work together. I think we're, we're doing good. But it, they never interfered along the way, you know? And so I was able to do whatever I wanted to do, but I had a day job and I did it, whatever I wanted all the time. And if someone didn't like it, I walked. I, I just walk, we don't negotiate. We, you go and you make, you make the work somewhere else and you do the best work you can and it's very edgy and it's on, it's, you know, it's very expressive. And so the galleries aren't gonna do very good at supporting that, you know, because that's a collector who's gonna wanna buy that and be educated, you know, before they get that. And so that's, that's a hard thing to find uh, for the native artists. And so, so I'm just saying that certainly having that apparatus be the, the benchmark isn't really healthy. It, you know, so so if you don't really need it for a while, hopefully. You know, later you do, but I wouldn't take it as, as a young artist. I wouldn't mess with that at all. Just do your research, do your work, make your exploration, ex explorations in your visual art or however you want to call it, but do it on your own, you know, without the institution kind of being on your back. So that's going to be our final word. Um, thanks to Kathleen. <laughs> Thank you, Edgar, really, for being here. Thank all, thanks to all of you. Um,